Good afternoon, everyone. We are excited to welcome you to the webinar this afternoon. Today we have Molly Graham, who will be uh, doing an introduction to NOAA's Voices Oral History Archives. Molly Graham is a professional oral historian and documentarian. She trained at the Salt Institute for Documentary Studies in Portland, Maine, where she produced the award-winning radio documentary, Besides Life Here which has been licensed by several national public radio affiliates. She has her master's degree in library science and archives management from Simmons College in Boston. And Molly is the former director of the oral history program at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum and assistant director of the Rutgers Oral History Archives. We are excited to welcome Molly and I will uh, have one housekeeping thing. If you have questions, please hold them until the end and place them in the question panel. We will have a few audio clips during this presentation as well. So please uh, fiddle with your audio dials to make sure that you can hear the, the, uh, the clips clearly. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Molly. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's always so weird to present to people that you can't see. Um, but welcome, and thank you for spending your lunch hour with me, learning more about the Voices Oral History Archives and the work we do and support at NOAA. Again, my name is Molly Graham. I'm the project manager for the Voices Oral History Archives, and I've been an oral historian and radio documentarian for about 10 years, and I've been with Voices since January 2018. Um, it's been a really exciting almost two years, and I'm excited to tell you more about it today. I want to use our time to introduce you to or update you on the Voices Oral History Archives, its database and website. We'll talk about the evolution of the program, how it was formed, grown, changed, expanded, and modernized. We'll also talk about the value of oral history as a research and educational tool. And I want to introduce you to the database and share some stories from the collection. And then we'll cover how to use, search, and explore the site, how voices can help support your own work and research. And then finally, we'll talk about next steps, some projects we have on the horizon, particularly the NOAA 50th Anniversary Oral History Project that seeks to document and celebrate 50 years of voices, perspectives, and reflections on NOAA's growth as an organization and its impact on environmental science, service, and stewardship. So we'll dive right in. I think it helps to have a working definition of oral history, not because I don't think you know what it is, but to reiterate that it's so much more than pressing record. Also because I told someone recently what I do for a living and he thought I studied mouth bones. So it's, it's not that, and <laughs> just so we're clear. Uh, oral history is the gathering and recording of the human experience through the process of interviewing. I like to think of oral histories as living talking time capsules of whole human lives. The recording includes the contents of someone's life, their family history, childhood experiences, education, career, family life, their expertise, and then the context of their life, such as national uh, and local historical movements and moments. In 2011, I worked, for the, I worked as an oral historian for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And one of my first weeks on the job, a young student came in and said that our program had interviewed his grandfather, but that he didn't get to know his grandfather very well before his grandfather passed away. And so I was able to pull his grandfather's interview off a shelf, set him up with some headphones, and then he could have his grandfather tell him his whole life story himself. And so that part of it is really cool. Also in Wisconsin, I digitized the oral history collection. It was all analog when I arrived on cassettes. And I made sure that everyone who had participated in the program received a CD copy. And then one day I got a call from a woman who, um, who had received her late husband's CD in the mail. And she called to thank me because she said it was like he was back with her for the weekend. And so these interviews can really bring people back to life. And the interviews I do are life course interviews. We really talk about everything from um, the very beginning to where we are in the present. It's an opportunity to hear about someone's memories, their stories, perspectives, and interpretations in their own voice and style. Um, at SALT, I was taught to uh, approach the people I interview with a felt life access. Um, and this is a term borrowed from Henry James. It means the, the closest and mo most authentic understanding of another person. The oral history interview is the closest we can get to understanding another person's experience. Um, and so we understand not just what happened, but what life felt like for the person we're talking to. 
Also in Wisconsin, I interviewed a World War II veteran who served in the Pacific where his ship was torpedoed and sunk. He was stranded in the water for hours, and when I asked him what that was like, he said, it was wet. And I said, no, no, tell me what it was really like. And then he started to talk about his girlfriend back home, how he wasn't sure in this moment he would see his family again. He started making sense of the war and his role in it. And so this is why we do oral history, to get at what these moments were really like for those who lived through them, not just the dates and names. And there's really a lot at stake in these interviews. It's a big deal if you're getting how it really happened. Um, it will feel like you're breaking down walls that have been up for many decades. And often the oral history interview is the first time people are telling their whole story. And as the oral historian, it's my job to preserve these experiences and make them available for future generations. And it's a really big responsibility. But it's why this is so important and so cool that NOAA is doing this and has such a large collection dedicated to making environmental and institutional history available to students, scholars, and the general public through the Voices Oral History Archives. And I want to say a little bit about what makes oral history different from other primary and historical sources, um, and very different from the kind of data that NOAA is used to gathering. Alessandro Portelli, who's like the godfather of oral history, talks about how oral history has a different kind of credibility. Um, he says it's not just what people did, but what they intended to do, what they believed they were doing, and what they now think they did. So it's an interpretation of the past. Oral history tells us less about events themselves than about their meaning. We may not get all the facts right or events in their proper order, but we can understand the impact it had on the person we interview. And oral accounts are based on memory, which is shaped and changed by time, new experiences, and our unique perspectives. So often the details are lost, but the gist remains. And oral history is narrative. It has stylistic differences compared to other historical resources. What you read in a textbook sounds different. You know, print resources don't laugh or cry or tell you jokes, but oral history does. And those sources don't contain the nuances of the human voice or the imperfections of how we remember the past. And oral history really comes to life. You hear the emotion, the expressions, and the accent of the narrator. An interviewee may cry, laugh, or yell during the course of the interview, so you can really sense uh, firsthand how the events of their life have impacted them. And the oral history interview is an opportunity to travel back in time with the narrator, have them take a look around and describe it for those who were not there and then. And it brings to life an experience that others weren't there for, but now can more closely understand through the oral history. And again, the listeners and readers of the interview get to participate in a sensory experience, not one where we only hear the facts or the chronology of an event. And I wanna play a clip for you from an interview with Robert Reiners. He's a World War II veteran who in this clip is talking about his honor flight experience. And in this excerpt, which is about three minutes long, um, he really touches on all the things I've just mentioned. The details are lost, but the gist remains. You can get a sense of the different kind of credibility. It's an emotional moment. There's fragility of memory, and it's a sensory experience. We can really picture clearly the scene he's describing. Also, he's giving a voice to the voiceless, and that's a big motivation for people interviewed in the Voices collection to share their stories because others can't, um, and so that it's available for future generations. So I'm going to play this clip, and you may again need to adjust your audio accordingly. And it was misting while we were there. And Senator Dole greeted us. I understand that he greets almost every honor flight. And I can tell you this, that is a overwhelming and haunting experience at the same time. They say grown men don't cry. I saw a lot of men crying that day. And unashamedly, they have a wall there with gold stars. And I understand there's over a thousand gold stars on this wall. Don't quote me on that. 
every star represents, I don't know if they said a thousand or whatever. But the caption on says, this is the real price we pay for freedom. Four hundred thirty thousand killed. What a loss. What a loss. Can you imagine what those men could have done for this country? Who knows? Future scientists, engineers, carpenters, plumbers, whatever. All lost. Nobody wins a war. Nobody. These young men coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. My heart goes out to them. To be in combat and come home in one piece. It's a blessing and a shame at the same time. Nobody has a death wish, but to survive and live a rich full life while others paid the supreme sacrifice. It's a burden. And it's a burden no one else can share with you. It's one you bear by yourself as hard as they try. You'll go to the grave with it. And so I play this clip for you to get a sense of, give you a sense of what we capture in our collection. There's a real sense of historical change, the meaning of one's contributions, and so much more. And this is so valuable, especially in a collection that documents changes in the environment, atmosphere, climate, fisheries, oceans, and coasts, because these changes are real, often permanent, and have enormous impacts on ecosystems, industries, traditions, and families. <clears throat> um, I just want to say a little bit more about why we do oral history, its purpose, and our goals in documenting history using this methodology, and why it serves NOAA so well as a way to document its legacy and impacts. But oral history can also be a way for NOAA to accomplish its work by serving its stakeholders, preserving important stories, and measuring historical change. Oral history serves as a source of information that's not already available. Together, the narrator and interviewer are creating a brand new primary source document that contains information not available in other formats. When I sit down with a narrator, I'm creating new information, and it's really exciting. A number of years ago, I was commissioned by the American Civil Liberties Union to document its institutional history in preparation for its 100th anniversary next year. And I interviewed a longtime lawyer for the ACLU, um, Stephen Pivar, who had been in charge of the Mountain States region for the ACLU, and who had started his career as a staff attorney on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And throughout his 16-hour oral history interview, he would keep stopping to say with tears in his eyes, no one knows these stories until now. And so that was really exciting. And it's what's so special about doing oral history. You're creating rich, qualitative primary source material with eyewitnesses to important historical changes. It's also a great way to supplement the quantitative data to get the stories and the human impact and the human dimensions behind it. Oral history also has shared authority, shared between interviewer and interviewee. And this is really unique, especially for a scientific organization. The interviewee is not the subject, they're the co-author, and it's a joint effort. And I like to say to an interviewee, I'm the expert on recording and asking questions, but you are the expert on your own life. Also, oral history links past the present. Again, this is the closest we can come to understanding the experiences of survivors of genocide, migrant workers, World War II soldiers, scientists, and fishermen, and countless others. 
And an example of this comes from an interview um, my former program did with Makara Mang. Uh, she was five years old when the Khmer Rouge came through her town and she lost every member of her immediate family except for her mother. And this is a clip about a minute and a half where she talks about life in the labor camp where she was sent. And again, you may need to adjust your audio. Life in Dobin Khmer Rouge was beside um, hard work. Um, that's nothing else. You only do you you work or you die. Um, my job start at four in the morning um, until noon. Lunch was a bowl of a bowl of water with a few grain of rice. If you cooperate, I wasn't the kid that cooperates, so <laughs> most of the day I had just a bowl of water. You have to done well in order to get four or five grain of rice or with that water. Um, yeah, so I ate whatever I can get my hands on. Um, cricket, uh, frogs, this is not big frog, the little baby frog or whatever that, what is that called? Um, grasshoppers, grass themselves, the, yep, all kinds of leaf and fruit whatever that animal eat i would eat so hopefully you can hear how oral history allows us to connect the experiences of ordinary people and place it in this broader historical context again we're transported back in time and we can experience history firsthand and this really gives us a greater understanding of events and periods and a more complete historical record of the past I'm currently working on an oral history collection to document the evidence and effects of climate change in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And as part of this project, I'm interviewing some fishermen who either don't believe climate change is happening, or if it is, it's not that big of a deal, or that it's part of some long cycle that will eventually recover. And this is part of the story. It's important to get different perspectives, even if they're ones that you may not agree with. Also in college, I wrote my thesis on early female radio broadcasting pioneers because any general history of broadcasting totally leaves women out. And oral history is one way to fill in gaps in the historical record and get a more representative picture of the past. It's important to make sure that every voice is heard, especially from marginalized or overlooked populations. So oral history helps us truly get a people's history. And I think about how important this is in the fishing industry or the weather service, for example, with changes in practice and technology and tradition and how important it is to get eyewitness accounts before they're lost forever. And I wanna play you another clip. I think this is the last one of the presentation. Um, and this is from my Gloucester collection, and it really illustrates what would be lost if we didn't collect these stories. Uh, this is an excerpt from an interview with an old timer fisherman who comes from a long line of Italian fishermen in Gloucester. My father, when they were young, and they all went to his funeral when he died. <laughs> I was, that's the only time I ever saw them all together at the same time was there. And, and I never knew, I never knew that my father went fishing with them because we never talked about, that was, when we came over my mother's, we never talked about fishing because my mother didn't like it. Didn't like the whole, the whole thing about the, the, the head of the family away. See, that's why. Most of the Italian families, the wife did everything because the husband was working, he was fishing. I can remember in high in grammar school, I never forgot it. I was I was in a history class and this kid was talking about, oh, my father took me to the baseball game. And I looked at him, I said to him, I said to the kid, I said, how, did you, how did you get to go to baseball? Wasn't he fishing? And I didn't realize that that, that, that was the only thing that I knew. Everybody I knew went fishing, but there was this kid. He, I know my father never took him to a baseball game. He didn't even know where it was, you know. But I mean, that was really weird that that I can think back that thinking of them looking at it. 
And I didn't realize that there was other things in the world with other fish. I love that clip so much. And I love that line. I didn't realize there were other things in the world other than fishing. It really gives you a sense of what role this industry played in this man's life. Um, and you get a sense also of the Italian family dynamic and the role of women. You get a sense of how powerful a force fishing was for the fam families of Gloucester. And this guy didn't even know fathers were meant to take their sons to baseball games. Something else this narrator said later in the interview was that he didn't get to know his father until he was in his 20s and started fishing with his father. It was a way for them to connect and relate to one another, but also pass on family history and traditions. And this is a reoccurring theme in a lot of these interviews with older fishermen. And this is what's at stake for the Gloucester commercial fishing fleet right now as there are fewer and fewer boats and fishermen around. And oral history gives individuals a sense of belonging, that their story in life has value because it's being shared in this way. And that's the same for the interviewer. Conducting interviews with those that you share a town and state with will provide a strong sense of community. It can give you new perspectives on the past and bridge generations of people. I've moved around quite a bit to do this work and it's the best way to get to know a place, to interview folks who've lived there their whole lives. Um, and it's really a service for the person being interviewed. They feel important and that their life and life story has value. So it's really a gift and a service for the people we interview and their family members and future generations. And finally, oral history allows us to tap directly into the human experience. It serves as a direct intervention into this pervasive social disconnection that's taking place. We're too used to communicating with one another through and behind screens. And we're forgetting to turn to our family and friends and say, what's your experience of your life? And oral history is a really great way to do this. Also, there's an urgency to this type of work and it gives voice to the voiceless. That's again, a motivation for people to share their stories to honor those who cannot. People take their memories with them when they pass. I never interviewed my grandparents and now I never can, that history is lost. And finally, oral history makes the quiet voices loud. It's this egalitarian platform that allows underrepresented populations to have their stories amplified, preserved, and heard. Um, so now that we know how important and valuable oral history is, I just wanna take a minute to update you on the voices site and database and all the changes we've experienced in the last year or so. Also, if you're not familiar, the program began in 2003 with a small student conducted project in Jonesport, Maine, interviewing local fishermen. A database was then crea created to provide a publicly accessible archive for these and other um, oral history interviews. And then with a grant from NOAA Pres Preserve Initiative, now NOAA Heritage, and then also support from the Office of Science and Technology, the database grew from these 25 student conducted interviews to what is now over 1,500 oral histories, I have to update this slide, uh, from New England, the Gulf Coast, the Pacific Coast, Samoa, and beyond. And in the last year or so, we've expanded our scope beyond the fisheries to encompass stories from all line offices and NOAA services. And so that's what we have in our collection, testimonies from over 1,500 experts and eyewitnesses, to the changing environment as part of over 75 distinct collections. And that's really incredible. It's the largest oral history collection of its kind, and it serves so many audiences from the people being interviewed to the staff, scientists, and administrators who work at NOAA, to anyone who wants to better understand NOAA's history and its impact on the, on the planet and its people. <clears throat> um, I'm also so impressed by the diversity and depth of experience captured in the database. We have interviews in different languages and capturing various dialects and accents. All of the interviews illustrate the intersections of environment with family, tradition, regulation, technology, and so on. We also have countless interviews with fishermen who have been working in the fisheries their entire lives, but so have their father, grandfather, and son, so they can speak to changes in the industry and environment over decades and generations. We have interviews with women who are the wife, mother, daughter, or sister of fishermen, but we also have lots of interviews with fisherwomen, including one really rich uh, NOAA-based collection with Alaskan Native women fishermen. And we have in our collection um, recorded in Cape Cod in the 19, we have a collection recorded in Cape Cod in the 1970s. There's an interview of someone who got drunk with Marconi, the inventor of the radio, in a bar in Cape Cod at the turn of the 20th century. And he says how Marconi was bragging about this thing he was gonna invent, the radio, and how it was gonna change the world. 
And there are interviews with community leaders and public officials in the database, such as Beverly Perdue, North Carolina's 73rd governor. <clears throat> and she talks a lot about establishing bridges between the commercial and recreational uh, fishing communities. There are eyewitnesses to the evolution of every kind of fishery, species, practice, and technology, and the regulatory change thereof. There are collections dedicated to documenting and understanding the graying of the fleet taking place in coastal communities. There are interviews with experts in every field pertaining to environmental and marine studies, zoologists, ecologists, environmentalists, biologists, climatologists, and so much more. And the database serves as a really rich resource of institutional memory with collections documenting the history of NOAA, the Milford Lab, the Science Centers, and many more. We have a 100 interview collection called Voices from the Science Centers, which documents the institutional knowledge of fishery scientists and administrators in NOAA fisheries labs across the United States. And then there are testimonies from people who have worked in declining or obsolete industries like sardine canning. We have a, a whole collection um, from Prospect Harbor, Maine with the last sardine cannery in the state. And these are stories that we lose when we lose the person who can speak about it. There's also compelling descriptions and reactions to deaths at sea. This speaks to the risks and hazards involved in working on the water and what it means to lose someone at sea. The interviews we housed illustrate the urgency of capturing oral history. Once we lose someone, we lose their voice and the ability to tell their story. For example, there's an interview in our collection with Maria Santos, and she's telling the story of her husband, Antonio Santos, while he, he lies nearby, unable to tell his story due to Alzheimer's disease. And the interviews take you all over the world and allow you to travel through time with descriptions of places that no longer exist because of coastal erosion and rising water levels. And all of these voices come to life through these interviews. The narrators paint the picture of their life, the context in which it was lived, and what it has all looked, smelled, and felt like and meant to them. And so in the beginning of 2018, we wanted to create an improved database that served this collection and these voices well. We listened to our stakeholders, incorporated feedback from our users, and designed a repository that suited the needs of our researchers, contributors, partners, and new audiences. We wanted to ensure that anyone from a grade school student to somebody's grandmother could search, browse, and discover interviews on the site. And something I say a lot is an oral history's value is in its access and use. Preserving and protecting and making oral histories publicly available is how we expand the historical record. These stories are not useful or valuable if they cannot be read, heard, or accessed. So this access and use was our guiding principle in designing and creating the new site. We approached the NIMS Office of Science and Technology seeking to upgrade the site, but they offered to build us a brand new site and database with all the bells, whistles, and search functionality that we desired. And we worked closely with Avi Litwak. He built the architecture to the site. He determined the layout, fields, and display. And then I spent several months moving each interview over from the old site to the new site. So I manually migrated the existing collection of then over 1,200 oral histories. And this was a really time intensive process that involved cleaning up metadata, proper file management, rearranging and redescribing interviews that required more detailed abstracts, and then indicating where there are needs and gaps in the collection. And so the complete database redesign now functions like other online repositories with keyword search capability, unique URLs and DOIs for each interview to record, um, share, cite, and send, hyperlinked metadata connecting interviews and collections, the ability to search across collections. There are now various ways to discover, browse, and index the interviews, and a much easier uploading process for practitioners to share their research. So I just want to take a few minutes to explore the site. Let's see if I can navigate out of here real quick. So here's our homepage. Um, under the Explore Collections tab, you can access the interviews in two different ways. You can browse by collection name or do a keyword search. And because my internet's a little slow, I've brought up different tabs. Um, so on the search page, you can put in a keyword, you can narrow by collection name, interviewer, affiliation, and location of interview. Um, so we've indexed the interviews in a number of different ways. 
and we may make some more advanced indices in the future, like for role or gender, things like that. Doing a keyword search for climate change um, in a collection that's been mostly focused on the fisheries yields 138 oral history interviews. Um, there may be more, but the database isn't fully transcribed or described, so that's something I'm, I'm working on. Um, one of the interviews from those results is an interview with Ann Richards as part of the Voices from the Science Center's collection. Um, you can see all the hyperlinked metadata here, so if you, <clears throat> if you want to see all the other interviews from the Voices from the Science Center collection, you can click here. All the other interviews across all of the collections that have been conducted in Falmouth, you can click here. Or if you love Joshua Wrigley's interviews and you want to see what other interviews he's done, you can click here. So these are all hyperlinked. You can read a little bit more about the interview under the description. And this interview has both an audio file attached to it and a transcript. So I'll just play a few minutes or maybe just a, a little bit of the audio for you. And I think we went maybe once or twice as I was growing up, but I never really did uh, go to the, we never went to the beach. I went maybe as a high schooler, we had moved to Western Mass near Springfield um, when I was uh, nine, I guess. So I went a couple times in high school with friends, but the way I got connected to marine biology really had was happenstance. Um, I knew from a pretty early age, I think that I wanted to do something with biology. I just was always drawn to the outdoors and to animals. And I remember when I was about 12, having an epiphany. And it was that my, you know, my parents would always ask us, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you think you want to do? And so I would think about it, but I didn't really have any answers. And then finally, <clears throat> I figured it out. I wanted to be a naturalist. So I also pulled up the transcript that's associated with this interview so you can read along or you can just do a control F search for what you're looking for. Um, and so access these interviews in various different ways depending on your research purposes. You can also just kind of browse the transcript and I can see that this is a really good interview. A good sign of a good interview is short questions from the interviewer and then long, rich, uninterrupted responses from the interviewee. So going back to the search page, um, you can search again by collection name, interviewer, interview location and affiliation. And I pre-pulled up um, a search for interviewer. One of my favorite interviewers is a woman named Galen Koch. Uh, she's based in Maine. <clears throat> she's a radio documentarian who travels up and down the main coast in her Airstream camper with her dog Zed, collecting and preserving stories of the working waterfront. So I'm constantly living vicariously through her. And you can see that Galen has done 54 interviews that are part of the Voices collection. Um, most of these are part of an ongoing project she does where she parks her Airstream at the Maine Fisherman's Forum and invites attendees to participate in half hour interviews over the course of the three day conference. And one of her interviews is with Tap Pryor, um, who was on the original commission that founded NOAA. And in this interview, he talked about how NOAA was named, about his work uh, growing oysters on land first and in Hawaii and now in Brunswick, Maine. And I'll just play a, a little bit of that interview. The thing I'll have you do is just state your name and where you're coming from. initiated and President Johnson and, and Vice President Humphrey wanted to do the same in the oceans. And so they formed a commission headed by Julia Stratton, the, the uh, then president of M MIT. And uh, they named six commissioners, 11 commissioners to do it. And we met uh, over several years uh, in Washington every week, every month. And uh, finally published in uh, January 1969, uh, the uh, publication called Our Nation and the Sea, which presented the whole uh, possibilities for marine biology and, and marine engineering and marine conservation. So I'll stop it there, but I just think it's so exciting that we have an eyewitness of Noah's origin story tucked in our collection <clears throat> and how valuable that is. And also on his record, you can see all of the hyperlinked metadata here that can connect you to other interviews also links to the affiliations involved. And we've recently added 
<laughs> excuse me, but I need to update the records, uh, a PI field. Um, often PIs are, you know, heavily involved in the organizing, funding, and making it happen of the, of the oral history collection, but they're not properly cited. Um, and then you can also search by PI. So you can find all of the interviews that Patricia Pinto da Silva has organized as part of her work. Um, and then there's a suggested citation for researchers to use. And we're working closely with the NOAA Central Library to assign <clears throat> a DOI to each interview record. And so they're creating 1,500 and counting uh, unique DOIs, which are digital object identifiers, to link, track, and cite the interview like an academic article. Going back to the search page, you can pull up affiliation. So I pulled up um, all the interviews associated with NOAA NIMPS. And you can see that there are 576 sort of NOAA-born uh, oral histories that have been conducted as part of projects documenting the Oregon fisheries, the science centers, <coughs> alewives and eels in Maine, and the Deepwater Horizon disaster, and the stories and experiences of fishermen's wives, and so much more. And I actually have in my queue to process almost 500 more NOAA-born oral histories to add to the archive, and not just from fisheries. So this is a massive effort with so many partnerships within and outside of NOAA that links people and places through the interviews. <coughs> and I just think that's so exciting. So exciting that I'm losing my voice. <laughs> and um, I, don't know, I don't know if we should do this now, but I thought maybe in the chat box you could suggest a couple search terms and we could try out, um, try out a search together. This would show us uh, what we have in the collection, but maybe what we need more of. So if people want to throw out a couple chat, um, throw out a couple suggestions for a search in the chat box, I welcome you to do that. I'll give you a minute to brainstorm and if nothing comes up, I'll just move on. Hi, Molly. We actually got a few that came into the question panel. Okay. Um, could you search for oil spills? Great idea. I'll search for oil spill, which would grab all of the interviews with oil spills. And it brings up 141 uh, oral histories. And again, there's, there's probably more, um, but not every interview is fully transcribed and described. And that's a massive effort, but one I, I hope to accomplish in the next couple of years. And you can also see that these are sortable. So if you want to sort alphabetically, you can um, sort these columns here. Same with interviewer name, affiliation, date of interview, uh, location of interview. Uh, each interview gives you a brief description and you can kind of click around. You can see that a lot of the interviews are coming up from the Deepwater Horizon oil disaster um, oral history project, which is a really comprehensive, rich, collection I'd encourage you to, to uh, check out. And so lots of lots of options there. Uh, should I try one more search to see what we have? Uh, sure. There is one for marine sanctuaries. Forty one. So not as much, but still still pretty good. And again, you can you can search um, and sort here. We have a collection, Cordell Expeditions, uh, Voices from the Science Center, Voices from Port, Sector Management in New England, all talk about sanctuaries. And then you can kind of click and explore um, interviews as they come up. And again, the most relevant search, ter search um, results are, are at the top of, of the page here. Um, some of the other tabs on the site, there's About Us, which just tells you a little bit more about the project and how it was started. Um, and then on the Participate page, you can access the Voices Oral History Guide that I wrote this year. This is a really good place to start if you're interested in doing oral history or getting involved in the, in the project. Um, it walks you through and tells you more about the value of oral history, project planning and design, research and preparation, um, conducting interviews and recording interviews, legal and ethical issues, preservation and access, and then there's a number of sample documents for you to use or borrow, um, an invitation letter to prospective narrators, a pre-interview survey to gather information, sample release forms, 
and then uh, finally more oral history resources to explore. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to get back to my presentation. Can you see that now? Yes, we can see your slides. All right, good. Um, so I, you know, why is oral history important for a government agency? Why should you know how to do it and use it? I, I think there's um, a number of useful tools and applications. I brainstormed some here, and we could sh we could share with the public a deep understanding of a number of important issues, such as disasters. We just brought that up. Documenting innovation, communicating weather, impacts of storms, and how people prepare, the social impact of fisheries regulations, um, the climate climate change, life in coastal communities. It also could be useful specifically for NOAA in terms of stakeholder perceptions, NOAA heritage and legacy institutional knowledge, um, exit interviews potentially. In every interview I've done as part of the NOAA 50th anniversary oral history project so far, the narrator wishes NOAA did more to record its history because it's lost when we lose track of these folks. Um, and feel free to throw some other suggestions into the chat or questions box and we can kind of take a look at those later. One slide I skipped was this right here. I wanted to point out that beyond the Voices Oral History Archives, there's so much oral history work being done at NOAA. Uh, since 2005, Cheryl Oliver and the NOAA Heritage Program have funded about 180 projects, 40 of which utilize oral history to document, preserve, and celebrate NOAA's history. Um, there's collections from Maine to Samoa, again, involving students, NOAA staff, and various communities. Not all of these projects have been deposited in the Voices database, but the ones that are, are listed here. And so there are collections that document, again, the Deepwater Horizon disaster, hurricanes Andrew, Katrina, Sandy, Irma, Maria, and others. And then there's projects that document community resiliency, NOAA heritage, and innovations like the turtle excluder device. There's a whole project on that called Ted Tales. And then there's forthcoming collections that document impacts of sector management, climate change, and interviews that document, again, the history of, of NOAA in preparation for its 50th anniversary next year. Other projects that I'm aware of um, are listed here, ones that document NOAA's history, community resilience, women fishers in Alaska, worm harvesters, young fishermen on the West Coast, uh, Buford Labs oral history, stories from the National Working Waterfront Symposium, habitat changes, stories from Tampa Bay, scientists in the Southeast Regional Office, voices from the West Coast, Cuban fishermen, red tide events, and, and I'm sure much, much more. Now that we've expanded our scope, it's much more inclusive and people who have oral histories um, that document other NOAA services can feel free to deposit their materials with us too. So it's really good, interesting, diverse stuff that I'm so excited to listen to process and help make available. And I just wanna say a little bit more about the NOAA 50th anniversary oral history project. Um, this is on the horizon for next year and part of this NOAA wide transition that we're making. And um, part of our effort to expand our scope means new partnerships, including one with NOAA Heritage and the Weather Service to document NOAA's history in anticipation of its 50th anniversary next year. Um, each of these stories are gonna be added to the Voices Archive and available to the public starting in January uh, next year. So stay tuned or reach out if you have questions about this project or ideas for other projects or need support in your oral history endeavors. Um, here's just other ways to participate. Um, you know, it, it can be useful for you in your work, finding primary source materials to supplement your research or as a way to do and house your research. Um, interviews are being used and end up in exhibits, books, articles, and various publications. There's voices exhibits around the country as part of permanent mobile or online exhibits. I know the Woods Hole Science Aquarium has a large permanent audio exhibit featuring Voices from the collection. Um, staff at NOAA's Southeast region built and curated an oral history kiosk for users to browse, explore, and listen to different oral histories. Also, our interviews end up in numerous publications and articles. I've been trying to keep track of Voices-related publications, and I've listed those on the next two slides. We were also recently cited and linked to in a Washington Post article about Carlos Rafael. So our materials are reaching really broad audiences. Also, Voices offers support, um, consultation, education, and training 
I've been doing workshops for voices and I'm always happy to arrange a call or let you know when I have another workshop coming up. I'm also happy to hear about your projects, consult on project design, review proposals, whatever I can do to support your oral history endeavors. And I'm also happy to hold your hand through sharing and uploading your collections on the Voices site. And so I mentioned um, all of the, the articles that cite or use the Voices Oral History Archive, and this is just some. Um, so I'm getting towards the end, um, and I've saved time for questions about oral history, the Voices collection, the work we do, or anything else you want to discuss in the, in the time we have left. Um, I think Katie will facilitate this part and read aloud the questions uh, that you submit. Yes, please uh, place those questions in the question panel. I do have one question first. Molly, will these slides be available? Would you like to share them? I would be happy to share them. I don't know the best way to do that. If you want to email me there, I can send you um, my presentation slides, a copy of the Voices Guide, or any other useful resources or, or documents. Great. I, I will direct people to contact you at your NOAA email then. That'd be great. Um, I did also want to let you know that the Central Library does have some oral history collections, including interviews with um, ARL scientists and from um, Alaska as well. So we should talk. We should. Okay, are there any other questions online from our audience? Great. Um, how, first question, how do we add a collection to the archives? Just get in touch with you or is there a different uh, route? Get in touch with me. That's that's your best bet. Right now, it's the it's one part of our website that isn't functionally functioning perfectly. Um, it asks you to sign up for uh, an account, and then I'm not quite sure what happens after that. So the best thing to do is to contact me, say I have this collection, um, and then I can help you process it. The way this has been working in the past is folks just send me the metadata and the associated um, audio files or transcripts, and I'm uploading them myself. There's a little bit of a queue for this right now, um, but you know, it, get in line while you, while you can. And I'm really eager to expand the collection into these other areas, as I mentioned. So e email me, and I will I will walk you through that. And hopefully, we'll get to a point where people can upload on their own. But I'm happy to take that off your off your plate in the meantime. Great, thank you. I'm going to give folks another minute to see if they have any more questions. I'm not seeing anything. So, uh, but thank you so very much, Molly. This was eye-opening and made me cry a little bit. So oh, these, yeah, these, <laughs> these recordings are very, very emotional. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so yes, if anyone has any further questions, I would ask you to direct them to Molly. If there's anything you have uh, for the library, please direct them to library.brownbag at noaa.gov. Yes, please and, reach out. I'm really always happy to talk about the Voices Collection and doing oral history. And I want to make sure that people are, are doing this well and feeling supported in, in their work. And according to Cheryl Oliver, Molly is a rock star. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone and have a good afternoon. Thank you.